Okay, folks, so I want to share just a little bit of information here from this Emerging Military Technologies, uh, this Congressional Research Service Report, background and issues for Congress from November of last year. And, uh, you know, I used to have a lot more respect for our military. Yeah, I really did. Be cool, you know, be just because you're supposed to, right? It's your country, it's your military. I love my country. I really do. But I don't like our government. I don't like the way our government is acting. And I don't have to like the way our government is acting. And I most definitely don't have to support a military as long as we're still associated with NATO. I want nothing to do with NATO. We need to get rid of NATO. We need to be done with NATO. I'm tired of it. The Patriot Act needs to go. There are so many things that I, I do not absolutely trust and believe in and support, and I don't have to. And as far as I'm concerned, if they're gonna be holding these gun manufacturers and the civilians responsible for what they do here at, at the civilian level, um, as far as bad things with, with bad weapons, how about we start holding these defense contractors accountable for literally murdering millions of people and destroying entire small nations? How about we hold the defense department accountable? I mean, I, Lockheed Martin and, and some of these defense contractors are literally getting away with murder. When is enough enough? You know, I don't have to support a military that is violating our constitutional rights either. That clearly has no respect for our own constitutional rights in our, in our country. Clearly, I don't have to support a military that has gone international, that takes international advice and and applies it here. I'm done with that. As far as Putin threatening uh, Klaus Schwab, too. Yeah, come on. Somebody needs to take down the entire world economic forum because they have gone way too far, way too far. And, and just enough is enough. Enough is enough. I just thought this was kind of curious here where they talk about some of the emerging technologies, right? And they're talking about the advancements that China and Russia has been making. And they specifically mentioned di directed energy as well. And it says right here, uh, more recently, the 2018 National Defense Strategy echoed the underpinnings of the third offset strategy, noting that the U.S. national security will likely be affected by rapid technological advancements in the changing character of war. New technologies include advanced computing or big data analytics, right? Artificial intelligence, autonomy, robotics, a directed energy, hypersonics, and biotechnology. The very technologies that ensure we will be able to fight and win the wars of the future. Of course, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, the 2022 National Defense Strategy notes that artificial intelligence, quantum science, autonomy, biotechnology, and space technologies have the potential to change war fighting. They have the potential to change war fighting, really? Haven't they already? I mean, hasn't artificial intelligence already changed the war fighting capabilities? Aren't they already using quantum computing and quantum sciences? Don't we already have a lot of autonomous crafts, autonomous weapons, autonomous vehicles, autonomous everything? Don't we, aren't we already dealing with biotechnologies and space technologies that have already changed the war fighting capability? The fact that they would create this Congressional Research Service report as recent as just last year, just within the last year, making statements like this, that it has the potential. I mean, really, are we to believe we're really that far behind? The United States is the leader in developing many of these technologies. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Sure we are. However, China and Russia, key strategic competitors, are making steady progress in developing advanced military technologies. They have been. Hello. As these technologies are integrated into foreign and domestic military forces and deployed, they could hold significant implications for the future of international security writ large and will have to be a significant focus for Congress, both in terms of funding and program oversight. Really? Uh, international security writ large, right? That's the whole guise of this whole NATO thing. I'm telling y'all, because uh, I'm repetitive, I have to say it again. NATO needs to go. NATO has been going around bullying and encroaching and taking over spaces and places that they have no business doing. And we need to stop funding it and we need to stop supporting it because enough is enough. Okay. It says here that uh, this report provides an overview of selected emerging military technologies in the United States, China, and Russia. Artificial intelligence, lethal autonomous weapons. Mm -hmm. Lethal for who? Hypersonic weapons, directed energy weapons, biotechnology, and quantum technology. It also discusses relevant initiatives within international institutions to monitor or regulate these technologies. Why do we need international institutions monitoring our technologies? Do we really need to have a global 
oversight committee monitoring every country and their development of these things? And how do we really trust them? Because I'm with, you know, I'm with Putin. Uh, Klaus Schwab needs to go. And the whole World Economic Forum, everyone involved with that whole global guidance system needs to be put on trial for crimes against humanity because enough is enough. Seriously. I'm just going to scroll down here because there was something really interesting about the artificial intelligence as well that I wanted to share. Um, hang on. Yeah, here it is. Uh, talks about the AI algorithms and everything too. Um, Although the U.S. government has no official definition of artificial intelligence, policymakers generally use the term AI to refer to a computer system capable of human-level cognition. Uh, never going to happen. There will never be a computer system or an artificial intelligence that will ever be capable of the human-level cognition. Never. Never going to happen. Just saying. AI is further divided into three categories, the narrow AI, general AI, and artificial superintelligence. Mm -hmm. Interesting, huh? Uh, it says here, um, these technologies are intended in part to augment or replace human operators, freeing them to perform more complex and cognitively demanding work, really. In addition, AI-enabled systems could, one, react significantly faster than systems that rely on operator input. Well, that means more people getting killed, right? Cope with an exponential increase in the amount of data available for analysis. And three, enable new concepts of operations such as swarming, i.e. cooperative behavior in which unmanned vehicles autonomously coordinate to achieve a task. That could confer a warfighting advantage by overwhelming adversary defensive systems. You don't say, didn't we just recently have some news coming out about China using a million drones or something and creating a swarm? I mean, it says here, uh, narrow AI, however, could introduce a number of challenges. For example, such systems may be subject to algorithmic bias as a result of their training data or models. Yes, because the AI is only as good as the person and the people programming it. Researchers have repeatedly discovered instances of racial bias in AI facial recognition programs due to the lack of diversity in the images on which the systems were trained, while some natural language processing programs have developed gender bias. Really? Hmm. Such biases could hold significant implications for AI applications in a military context. For example, incorporating undetected biases, biases into systems with lethal effects could lead to cases of mistaken identity and the unintended killing of civilians or non-combatants. Then my question is, if there's narrow AI is already doing this, who programmed it to do that to begin with? Because it's not just learning it on its own. Think about it. Similarly, Narrow AI algorithms can produce unpredictable and unconventional results that could lead to unexpected failures if incorporated into military systems. I believe it already has. And in a commonly cited demonstration of this phenomena illustrated in figure one, researchers combined a picture that an AI system correctly identified as a panda with random distortion that the computer labeled nematode. The difference in the combined image is imperceptible to the human eye, but it resulted in the AI system labeling the image as a gibbon with 99.3% confidence. Such vulnerabilities could be exploited intentionally by adversaries to disrupt AI-reliant or assisted target identification, selection, and engagement. This could, in turn, raise ethical concerns. Oh, you don't say, hmm, or potentially lead to violations of the law of armed conflict. If it results in the system selecting and engaging a target or class of targets that was not approved by a human operator, didn't we already experience this issue with drones targeting people that they thought were one thing, but it ended up being a freaking wedding party, right? Mm -hmm. Finally, recent news reports and analysis have highlighted the role of AI in enabling increasingly realistic Photo, audio, and video digital forgeries, popularly known as deep fakes. And they've known about deep fakes since the 60s, folks. And Nevada was one of the first states in the union to actually uh, formulate uh, rules and some regulations around deep fakes after 1 October because too many people were coming out and calling things out like how they saw it. And uh, it says here, adversaries could deploy this AI capability as part of their information operations in a gray zone conflict. Deep fake technology could be used against the United States and its allies to generate false news reports, influence public discourse, erode public trust, and attempt blackmail of government officials. For this reason, some analysis analysts, excuse me, 
argue that social media platforms, in addition to deploying deep fake detection tools, may need to expand the means of labeling and authenticating content. Doing so might require that users identify the time and location at which the content originated or properly label content that has been edited. Other analysts have expressed concern that regulating deep fake technology could impose an undue burden on social media platforms or lead to unconstitutional restrictions on free speech and artistic expression. Hmm, I believe that's happening, right? These analysts have suggested that existing law is sufficient for managing the malicious use of deep fakes and that the focus should be instead on the need to educate the public about deep fakes and minimize incentives for creators of malicious deep fakes. So,